for you. Can you all see me and hear me okay? Fantastic. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. If everyone, if you're, if it's possible, please do turn your cameras on. Makes for a more engaging discussion, especially when we get to breakout rooms. Um, much easier to discuss if you have your cameras on. And it's also easier for me to teach when you have your cameras on. All right, let's begin with an opening prayer. Oh. 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 Sahana Vavatu, Sahano Bunaktu, Sahavi Vyankaravahai, Tejas Vinavadhi Tamas Tuma Vid Vishavahai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwaraha, Guru Deva Param Brahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. How are you, everybody? Welcome to the first edition of this year's Chick Satsang series. It's wonderful to be here. And I picked the first slot. Easier to set the bar low and then just let others do the real work. So that's the plan here. And we'll meet every single month. Now, I'm so glad that we have chicks from all over the country participating in this. And I can tell where you guys are from because some of you are wearing hoodies and everything where it's getting cold where you are. And for us here in Texas, it's still a boiling 90 degrees during the day. So we're still enjoying that while uh, you guys are starting to bundle up where you are. So just shows you the national flavor of where everyone's from. Now, the intention behind this satsang series that was started last year was especially for those chicks who are in centers where they don't have a regular satsang outlet, this provides that monthly pick-me-up, so to speak. And by design, it's not just a setting where it's lecture-based, but there's also that component of group discussions within breakout rooms so that you're really exploring these ideas with your peers. And I'm so glad about this year's topic. So if we look at Srimad Bhagavad Gita as a whole, we can easily say it's a handbook for living. Now, when we use a term that is so broad, like a handbook for living, that gives the scope to focus on areas that we find worthy of focus, even if that's not the full intention. What do I mean by that? When I finished the Brahmachari training course at Sandipani, I was on the way back to America. I was in the Mumbai airport, and my thinking was, I'm about to get on a flight for the next 10 to 11 hours. Why not get some steps in so that my legs don't like lock up on the flight? Let's walk for an hour or so. So once I got through security, I'm walking around the terminal, and I came upon a bookstore. You know how some people have this shopping addiction where if they see a store with shoes or dresses, they cannot walk away from there. They got to go in. My weakness is books, all right? If I see a bookstore, I got to pop in just to see what's there. You never know. You never know what you're going to come across. So I went into the bookstore, and I'm browsing, and for an airport bookstore, they have a lot of books. And there's an entire, not even shelf, just one full wall of like three shelves just on religion. So being in my line of work, that really piqued my interest. Within that wall, they have one full shelf just about Bhagavad Gita. Wow, I'd never seen something like that before. An entire shelf dedicated just to Bhagavad Gita. Must be in India. So as I'm going through it, what do I see? Bhagavad Gita for parenting. Bhagavad Gita to be a millionaire. Bhagavad Gita for marriage. Bhagavad Gita for divorce. There's so many titles like this. Any topic under the sun, there's a Bhagavad Gita there for it. Oh, I thought to myself, if Bhagavad Gita could make me a millionaire... Why did I become a brahmachari then? I really did it wrong. 
if it could make me a millionaire, should be doing something else. So the deeper meaning here is Bhagavad Gita's pers- purpose is essentially serving as a moksha grantha. It is meant for my spiritual unfoldment to understand my identity as that supreme reality. Nothing short of that. And Bhagavan Sri Adi Shankaracharya Ji says that at the get-go in his commentary, that this is the purpose. However, we look at other areas of Bhagavad Gita that deal with self-improvement and development, that deal with understanding how my own inner instrument works, that deal with exploring even what seemingly the most ugliest parts of my personality, diving deep, exploring those parts only to wash them away and improve myself, Bhagavad Gita does all of that for me. It inspires me by showing me those lakshanas, quality of those realized masters. It gives me a perspective by showing me two different paths of qualities I can take, whether it's the Daivi Sampatti, filled with positivity and that graciousness in the personality to grow, or the Asuric Sampatti, not necessarily seen as good versus bad, but rather right versus selfish is what's shown there. So many of these sections giving us a window into our own personalities are peppered throughout the Bhagavad Gita. One of those most salient sections comes in the 13th chapter of the text. Now, 13th chapter of the text is highly technical. This is where Bhagavan Sri Krishna introduces words like Kshetra, Kshetragnya, Prakriti, Purusha, meaning what is that playing field that I'm given as a jiva to exhaust my vasanas? What is my role as that jiva in that field? What are these powers of that Ishvara in terms of manifestation, in terms of wielding what is manifested? All of that is gone through. Where you look at all the various darshanas and sampradayas that exist, there's slight philosophical differences in each of these, that change the entire makeup of what that focus of the sampradaya is, the very sadhana prakriya, meaning sadhana processes also change there. Now, at the get-go, we may feel that, man, why does it matter how we define certain words? It's just semantics at the end of the day. A small change in definition of what a jiva is, what this jagat is, what an ishvara is, even the slightest modification in those definitions can change my entire trajectory. It's like you go to a train station, and the trains all go from the same track at a station. After a little bit, they diverge a tiny bit right here. That tiny divergence right here on an Amtrak is the difference between going to D.C. or going to California at the end of the day. It makes a huge difference. Now, all that aside, that's the main crux of the 13th chapter, One entire section, however, is dedicated to what are those qualities to cultivate in order to eventually understand what this knowledge and what my identity is? What are those qualities that dictate my conduct, dictate my outlook on the world and my path? And that starts in the seventh shloka of this 13th chapter. Now, there are two words that I'll take up today. One is Amanitvam, the other is Adambitvam. Two very simple phrases, yet the punch that they pack in the mirror that they put up to look at my own personality is quite profound in its import. Amanitvam. Mana is that quality of thinking very highly of myself. Now, if you say, don't think of yourself as a great person. Out of all the people that I love, think about all the people that you love. For some of you, it's a huge list. Counting on your fingers and your toes. For some of you, trying to come up with more than three people is really hard to do. No judgment. Either way, think about your list of loved ones. Because we use love so frivolously nowadays. I was listening to a comedian recently, and he said, you know, we talk about certain words like love, amazing, incredible, without understanding their meanings, we just use them. 
where my friend recently had a baby the other day and he said, man, birth of a child, it's incredible. Yet that's the same adjective we use for a taco that we had at Taco Bell. That taco was incredible. Are we conflating the two? Is it the same amount of incredibleness then with both? So words, it's hard to find what their true value is. So when you say love, love is that measure where it's not simply an affection towards or a liking towards or a tolerance towards. It is that just as I would love a person or a dream or a vision for living, which I'm so closely associated with, I make it mine. That is that true love. Now, going by that definition, out of all the beings I interact with, whom do I love the most? Now, if your spouse or significant other is in the room, you have to say them. For your own safety, you have to say them. But even Shastra verifies, I love myself the most. Any other thing, any other person that I love is not inherently just for love for that thing, but for how they make me feel at the end of the day. It's always contingent upon that. And that's not me saying that. Our Shastra says so. So I love myself the most. When this is the case, Amanitvam is pointing to Mana is that quality of praising myself. Praising myself specifically where these qualities don't exist. Where one of the hardest things to do sometimes in any kind of profession, if you find yourself in a managerial position, is to give a critique of someone else. Some kind of uh, question that you have to answer about their performance as an employee. How creative are they? How, how much they use their time wisely? Things like this. Right, That's difficult to do. But even then, you can point out some positive negatives objectively because it's another person that you're talking about. Now, I'm sure all of you have gone through job interviews. What's the most difficult question to answer during a job interview? Tell me about your weaknesses, right? Isn't that the hardest question to answer? Now, we all know that if you answer truthfully about what your weaknesses really are, that puts you in jeopardy of not getting that job. That is a, the antithesis of what we're trying to do here when we go for an interview. So instead... You come up with those kinds of weaknesses that are very unique in nature. My biggest weakness is I don't believe in work-life balance. I have a family at home waiting for me at night, but forget them. I do everything I can to sit at the office and work. Or my biggest weakness is I'm very impatient. I'm trying to work on it, but I'm very impatient. You tell me something is due by Friday, it's going to be on your desk by Wednesday. I just, I know it's something I'm trying to work on, but it's a terrible quality of mine. We come up with these kinds of anti-weaknesses that look ostensibly like we are critiquing our own personality. Instead, it is <laughs> capitalizing on a part of our personality to go further. Mana is that quality. Where instead of actually objectively looking my, at myself in the mirror, I come up with some way to justify even those blemishes in my personality to benefit me in some way. That is that mana. Now, another layer of that mana is actually believing this kind of smoke. Hmm? My grandfather always used to tell, he told my dad and my dad told me this. One great message. Flattery is fine unless you inhale it, is what he used to say. That if there is something I do that's generating some positivity, there will be praise that comes from others. If someone wants something from me to butter me up, there will be praise that comes from others. If someone wants to put someone else down in my presence and they want to show a clear, stark distinction of who they favor and whom they don't, Praise will come my way for that purpose as well. Meaning, even when praise comes from others, for anything that I do, performing something in a certain way, a work that I've done, a personality trait, take it at its face value. No need to get carried away with that. 
Because when it gets really bad is when I start to believe this persona that I put out. Recently, I had the luxury of going to Ujjaswami Swarupananji's Make It Happen course at Chinmaya Krishnalaya. It's a series of workshops that focus on goal setting, building towards those goals, analyzing the personality in the quest of achieving that goal, and a host of other processes along that way. Now, one of the very first workshops that Puja Swamiji went through was, he asked us, what are those different masks that you wear? Masks that you wear. Halloween is upon us in a couple weeks, but that's not what he meant here. Masks meaning, based on the roles that we assume, there is a different persona, a different facade that we adopt to achieve the purposes of whatever role that is. As a brahmachari, for instance, when I'm giving a lecture to a group, like on Sundays especially, there will be a group of about several people listening. No matter how interesting a lecture is, at the end of the day, when sleep takes over, it takes over. So I see some of the funniest things, audience reactions. Mostly from adults. Kids will stay awake somehow. The adults are the ones, because of you know their age, they need the wall. So they sit back on the wall. That's already putting yourself at a disadvantage if you want to stay awake. And after a certain point, their heads start to bob. Like they're listening to like reggae music, their heads just start to bob like this. And that's my clear sign that, okay, T minus two minutes, they're about to be out like a light. And before I know it, I'll be in the crux of a very important point, something super deep that I'm trying to say, or I think is deep at least, giving that logic. And then I get silent for a second to let the logic sink in, let it marinate in their minds for them to really imbibe what that philosophical point is. In that silence, what do I hear? Old uncle has fallen asleep on the side right there. Now, the part of me that is, you know, around your age, I want to laugh and laugh loudly. It's funny to me. But as the brahmachari, the facade I have to put on is a persona of, I have to act like I don't even hear that. I have to go on with the lecture right there. Like that, how many different masks do we put on? There is that mask of authority that we have. Eventually, when some of you have children, when the rest of you have children, there is that mask of authority that we put on for our kids. Where it's not that we're trying to act all tough, but for them to listen to us, to respect, that mask is a necessary one. There's the mask of objectivity that we put on. Or at work, you've worked with the person for so long, been in their group for so long, you know what their lack of caliber is, yet, instead of rolling your eyes every time they say they'll do something, you put that mask of objectivity where you say, okay, I'll try to believe you this time. I saw one post one time that said, when I die, I want all the people that worked on group projects with me to lower me into my grave so that they can let me down one last time. So your team members at work may be that way. Yet, that mask of objectivity is, let me at least seem like I'm open to how they'll perform this time. So we wear these different masks. Now, what is that fine line where I can't tell whether that mask is something I wear at times or has that become my very personality? You see that credible fear that's there? Of what is that line even? I read a book about an undercover cop one time. Undercover cop. Where if you think actors have to jump into a certain role and take it on like a method style, undercover cop, it's life and death at that point. If he gets found out and he's working in some kind of a gang or a crime organization, that's it. They don't revoke your membership card. They take your life card at that point. That's how it works. So in there he wrote, after a certain point, I forgot who I was as the cop. And I was thinking to myself near the end, is it that I am a cop who is acting like a bad guy? Am I actually that bad guy who sometimes acts like a cop? That was the confusion that set into his mind. So when these masks are assumed for a purpose, and that becomes such a closely held part of my personality... It takes over. Now, as it relates to amanitvam, not 
thinking of myself too highly, if I'm praised by others, or if I try to have this persona and exude brilliance when it's not really there, exude confidence when it's not really there, exude rationality when it's not really there, that can come back to really be a part of my personality then. It's a false part of it, however. It's not the real me that's actually there. And when it's not the real me, and I go on introspecting about my personality, there is no growth because I'm not looking at my true qualities, what my true colors are. It's a sticky situation to find ourselves in. So amanitvam is that quality of inflating oneself. What is adambhitvam? Dambha is that quality of capitalizing on my own virtues for some name or some fame. The virtues are there, but just how amanitvam is amana, I mean, taking away that inflation of oneself is that what, is what it is. Adambhitvam is not capitalizing on my virtues for some kind of name or fame. Where there's one poignant moment in Mahabharata. This is where Bhishma Pitamaha is laying on the bed of arrows. The war has ended. Yudhishthira humbly, earnestly approaches Bhishma Pitamaha and says, I want to learn this knowledge of administration over a kingdom. So he asks him all kinds of questions. And the message that Bhishma Pitamaha gives, if it's codified, it's actually one of the greatest political philosophies the world has ever seen. In addition to what is personal growth. So there's one question, a very interesting, peculiar question that Yudhishthira asks Bhishma Pitamaha. He says, there are three qualities that come to my mind that I think about often. Pleasure, wealth, and virtue. Pleasure, wealth, and virtue. It seems like a lot of the situations that arise in one's life or in the trajectory of a nation or kingdom are closely linked with these three as the base. Pleasure, wealth, and virtue. Tell me, Bhishma, what is the relationship between these three? This is his question. And Bhishma Pitama's answer is so profound in just how practical it is. He says the real relationship between these three is wealth comes from virtue and pleasure comes from wealth. It's very linear in that way. That if I cultivate virtues where there is noble, honest, good living, the byproduct of that is a dharmic lifestyle which begets wealth in a positive way. And in turn, that wealth responsibly used, not simply for that sake of indulgence, but responsibly used, can lead to great pleasure. Think about it. Once you get out of college, when you start getting those regular paychecks, how liberating is that feeling? Where it's no longer having to, you know work with those $10 to get something at Taco Bell, you can treat yourself to some real food on a weekly basis even, or daily basis also. That's a great feeling to have. No longer the uh, penny-pinching college kid. You have something to call your own now. Wealth does give that good pleasure. Now, some of us get stuck in that phase of college and we still eat, like, nonsense. <laughs> that helps hurts the health later on. But... You don't have to do that because there is that wealth coming in. Pleasure is on a different scale then. No longer indulging in those cheap thrills. And again, wealth then comes from virtue. But then Bhishma Pitahamaha provides one caveat here. Saying what are the pitfalls of each of these different elements? He says the pitfall of pleasure is pleasure being sought responsibly can very easily seep into unmitigated indulgence. Or there's no longer responsibility of, is this dharmic in this way? Am I harming the body by seeking this pleasure? Is it something that hurts other people? Am I hurting myself in the long run, even though I feel happy doing it now? 
these rationality falls out the window at a certain point. Indulgence takes over. That is the root of desire at the end of the day. That's the pitfall of pleasure, he says. What's the pitfall of wealth? Pitfall of wealth is that I keep wanting more and more. When do I ever say, okay, I earned this much money. This is enough. I'm content now. Really? Pitfall is I keep wanting more. Because I know more money can lead to more problems, but more indulgence as well. Now, we would think at this point, does he point out a pitfall of virtue as well? Virtue is that which is noble, that which is cultivated in a positive way. How can we say there's a pitfall there? He says, yes, there is. The pitfall of virtue is, I want to cash in on that virtue to get some benefit from it. In the most basic of ways. We're at an airport, busily going through it. You know, you take everything out of your pocket, put it in that bin to go through security. You go through, and no matter how much you empty out, it turns out there's still some metal or something in your pocket. And especially if you look like us, they take you to the side and they pat you down like anything. And then in all of that mess, you leave your wallet behind. Don't even know it. Now, as you're rushing to your gate, you hear feel a tap on your shoulder. You turn around, it's a random person you don't even know. And they say, hey, you dropped your wallet. And you thank them profusely. They literally saved your life at that moment, didn't they? <laughs> your plans could go awry if they didn't do that for you. Then because they did that, then they expectantly look at you just really closely. Puppy dog eyes just looking at you. Where the least you can do at that point is buy them a Starbucks or something, can't you? The fact that they tracked you down and gave you that wallet. Least you can do. Now, not saying everyone expects that, but there is this expectancy that comes with fulfilling a virtue. That because I express this virtue, someone should either praise me because of it or reward me because of it. Because what's the use of doing good if no one knows about it, right? It's not just enough for me to know I did well. Others have to know also. And that's when they sing my praises. So the pitfall of virtue is trying to capitalize and cash in on it. That is that dumba that is described in the seventh shloka of the 13th chapter. Now, one caveat here with a few minutes to go before the breakout rooms. The caveat in this whole discussion is as young professionals, you find yourself in a situation now where don't you have to inflate yourself for the sake of upward mobility in the profession that you've chosen? Is that true to an extent? Is there a fair amount of self-inflation that you have to do functionally for where you find yourself? Having had a Vedantic background and being a student of Vedanta, do you feel that's hard to reconcile at times? That inflation expectancy that's there versus what you learn here in your chick satsangs. There's a healthy amount of reconciliation that's needed for this. Now, right off the bat, one thing is, given the society we live in, there are certain things we must do. Sorry to say there's no way around it. There are certain things we must do. To the point where when you're at work, Say they're two people. One is the person that diligently puts their head down, does not look for any kind of praise, does the work they're supposed to do, does it in a timely manner, treats others with respect, doesn't open their mouth too much because they focus on the work and their skill set and improving themselves. That's one person. The other personality is that person who, even if they pass gas, they have to go tell pen, tell people about it because every small thing they do, they have to inflate so that people think they're doing a lot. You see examples of both wherever you guys are working. Who is the one that rises in the company, most likely? Rises meaning promotions. Rises meaning attention for their work, whatever the quality, whatever they do. It's got to be that second person most of the time, right? Now, given that this is the case, many young professionals say, 
Eh. This whole idea of not puffing oneself up, that is impractical, is what they say. And it goes on to more neo-intellectualism that Bhagavad Gita was meant for a certain time, not for the modern age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we start on that whole train then. The caveat I introduce at this point, though, is where does it say in Bhagavad Gita that having these virtues means that I will have upward mobility in a group? Means I will have a promotion with more salary? Where in Gita does it say that? That those are the goodies that I get? The very beginning, what did we say? This is a book meant for moksha sadhana. That process that gives me this knowledge of what my true identity is, ascertaining which there is no more rebirth. That's the result I'm going for right here. No more rebirth. And instead we bring that down and we say the result I'm looking for from my actions is a higher salary or higher position or more love from the people. This Bhagavad Gita doesn't give me that, therefore it's impractical. The impracticality here is I'm bringing down the goal of the text, trying to make it suit what I want it to be, and then complaining, saying this round ball does not fit in the square peg. See the dissonance right here in our thought process? Where what the stated goal is, I veer from it, trying to use these various recommendations to fit some other kind of goal, and when invariably that doesn't work, I say it does not work at all. So even though we live in a society today where upward mobility, however you want to see it, yes, it does require a certain amount of puffery. If I engage in that for a functional purpose, can I separate myself and say ultimately as a sadhaka, however, these are not the kind of qualities I should be going for of cashing in on virtue or thinking too highly of myself. I'm more than that. Is that a realization that I come to? Now, one other point to think about, and hopefully it comes up in your discussions, is how much of this do I face head on on a daily basis? This meaning the introspective capacity to see, is it that I am presenting myself as I truly am? Or am I trying to present myself as better than I truly am? Because even from the most basic standpoint of appearance, for instance, you meet someone for the first time, before you get to know them, we already, whether we know it or not, we already make an impression of them based on how they appear to us. The way they're dressed, the way their hairstyle is, the way they conduct themselves, the way their gait is, the way they walk, all of this. Not that we act on those decisions purely, but first impressions matter, where we make an assumption whether we realize it or not. Now, when that assumption is made, so one common thing is dress for the job you want, not for the job that you have. Meaning refine yourself, look a bit sophisticated. Even if you are a hopeless rube, at least look a little sophisticated so that it creates a good impression at least. Like that, I can create that impression with my words. I can create that impression with my lifestyle, how lavishly I live, to project some type of persona. One thing to think about is how much time, effort, mental space goes into curating this exhibit of having to seem a certain way for other people. We change our actions based on whom we have to impress, what our intentions are. Once we were at a fundraiser for the mission. And as much as there should be no gossip going on in a chick group, we're human after all. So we were trying to wonder, these two individuals in our chick group, are they dating or not? Was what me and a fellow chick were discussing. Because some, so one of us thought that, yes, they are. They're always talking after class. And one of us said, no, no, man, it's not really dating. They're just friends. It's not like that. And there's one surefire way to tell. That girl's parents were coming from out of town to attend this fundraiser. Now, I could see, my prediction was, based on how this boy approaches her parents, meeting them for the first time here, that will dictate whether he's just a friend or if they're dating. Right? 
That'll make a difference. So the girl's parents are walking towards them, meaning this other chick are watching. Immediately, the guy does something I've never seen him do. He goes and lunges at the father's feet and takes his blessings right away. And I said, boom, they're dating. I told you. I told you they were dating. And I was right. So we present ourselves in a certain way of what is expected to get a certain result of that first impression with our words, thoughts, deeds, the way we approach a situation or a person. That is that mask at play. Now, how much time and effort goes into curating this persona and what are its effects? That's something worth looking at as well. So at this point, let's turn it over to the breakout sessions where I'll put you in breakout rooms, groups of about three or four. Is that too little? Is that too many awkward silences that are staring at each other? Four or five then. Okay, your eyes tell it all. Four or five is what we'll do. And two questions to discuss in there. Okay, I'll try to put it in the chat right here so that it's in one place for you. The very first question is, how much time and energy goes into creating these personas that we mentioned, which is that result of amanitvam, or the manitvam and dambitvam. Manitvam meaning thinking highly of oneself. Dumbitvam meaning trying to capitalize and cash in on my virtues. How much time and energy goes into creating these personas? What are the effects? That's question number one, two-part question. Question number two is, what, in your opinion, is that fine line between inflating myself for a functional purpose versus giving in to amanitvam, or amanitvam, sorry, amanitvam? What is that fine line between inflating myself for a functional purpose, updating that LinkedIn with your achievements? These are things inflating for a functional purpose versus giving into manitvam and dambhitvam. Look in the chat. You can copy it into another browser or server just so you have that these questions um, available to you when we go into breakout rooms. So we'll be in breakout rooms for a little bit. And if I come into your room, don't freak out. Act like I'm not even there. I'm just observing. One rule is, though, please have your cameras on in the breakout room. Y'all have cool names, but just staring at the name, it does not really lend itself to good discussion. We want to see your beautiful smiling faces. It's okay if you're having a bad... I'm also having a bad hair day. But <laughs> please do keep your cameras on. It makes it much easier then. So if we have five rooms... All right. Ready, set, go to your rooms.
All right, welcome back. I think there are a few more stragglers coming in. We'll wait for them for a second. And we're all back. No one got lost. Very good. So I was going around in the rooms, showing my best restraint by not jumping in in the conversations, and you guys were doing great. So for both of these questions, are there any thoughts you'd like to share? You can click on the raise your hand button, and I'll call on you to unmute. So for this first question, were there any interesting thoughts that you found in your group, either by you or by others, about how much time and energy goes into creating these various personas, and what are the effects that you find from that? Anyone would like to share? Arigi, we were supposed to discuss questions? What? We just talked about stuff. <laughs> I think one interesting group that I saw when it came to this discussion was Yash Sabu's group. Yash, what did you guys say about this question? Um, we basically said that, like, it takes a lot of time and energy into creating personas. Um, and that, like, I guess, like, I related it talking about, like, I just came out of the college application process and mm -hmm. about how that was, a like, straight six months of, like, intensely creating different personas that colleges want to see. Um, and the, the effects of it was kind of, like, you come out of it, like, feeling that like you're like you're fabricated in so many different ways um like there's so many like different versions of you for certain types of colleges um and you kind of like for me at least I kind of felt a bit like fake because I didn't know like which of these I even was um or like um and yeah so um yeah yeah uh we also said like I like putting on the mask like for too long um, can be like a really bad thing because then all you're thinking about is like like all like the achievements that you've accomplished and then you like like even if that don't, don't exist you feel too good about yourself but we also said that like if you pretend that you're like like it's like a fake it to make it strategy that like like if you pretend you're this type of person then you will become that type of person that you want to be um so i guess it's like that balance about what which way you're going you yeah. know one question I have for the general group here is based on this first question. Does it ever happen where I assume a certain persona for a functional purpose, but then as I go along with that mask, I find, man, this is actually a part of my personality I didn't know existed, but this is really me. Like, I really feel I've tapped into a certain part of my personality, which I can own up as myself, and I feel really comfortable in it. Has that ever happened? Anyone? Anushka, what are your thoughts on that? So uh, last year I was a Baudrillard teacher. And uh, so I I feel like I'm a pretty nice person usually, like not really, like, really strict. But I decided because I was teaching third and fourth graders. And mm. as you all know, they're crazy. Um, and so I decided like before going in that like, I cannot be like easygoing at all. I have to be extremely strict, especially because of my age. Like, um, they're, like they won't take me seriously if I don't, um, like if I'm not super strict with them. And so I went in and then I, and then after the first few classes, I was like, wow, this is working. Like I am able to be very strict and very focused. And I realize that that is actually like a part of me that really, really enjoys teaching these kids and being very serious about it, like about their education. And you never so, went back to being nice again, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I found it kind of tough actually, like being easier on them. But uh, yeah, it ended up being really awesome. So yeah. That's my little thing. Very good point. Tapping in right there. Anyone have any other thoughts on this topic? On this part of it? Srije, go ahead. Srije and then Shriya. Yeah. Go. Um, something I noticed is um, so we have our summer camp and I used to be a camper, then a youth volunteer, then youth volunteer coordinator, and I would just help coordinate the camp. And I'd be sitting with these youth volunteers and I'd be like, you guys are doing this thing. Like you guys are all congregating with each other, like you need to separate or 
am having this issue with you. And I know why you're doing it because I used to do the same thing myself. And like over time, it, I stopped doing that. Like these more responsibilities came on and I stopped doing this thing. And I, so I know that you're capable of stuff of not doing these things, but like, I, and I need you to do it, but I, I know why you're doing it because I was you and I was doing it myself. Reminds me when you said that of uh, I saw the resume of Nike's new CEO. If you guys have seen it, it's eye opening in that since 1990, what two, he's been an intern at that company, slowly risen through any level possible in there. The only gap is one year where he worked somewhere else. <laughs> Just loyalty, I guess. But he rose through from an intern level incrementally to be CEO. So every single part he knows what you said reminds me of that, of seeing the various angles of every single position um, that helps build that persona quite well. Shreya, what are your thoughts? Yeah, actually, I think um, I was wondering um, how it would be to like maintain a level of genuineness when we're like managing all these different personas in different contexts. Because um, like, for example, one of the things, so I am in um, the clinical psychology field. And one of the things that we get trained to do is as psychologists, we have to be genuine with our with our patients or else they're not really gonna like trust us or <laughs> like open up to us. And, and in different contexts, if they see us act differently, they're gonna question our authority and like what we're saying to them and like it's that that trust is like half of the job that we're that that is like for the job to be done that trust is needed to be built and I think similarly not just in that context but like with our friends and family and, and things like that if they see us acting one way in front of them another way in, in, in another context I think that building that relationship would become very difficult and if worlds collide I think that would be like that would be very difficult um so yeah I guess that was my um uh, like concern for like holding on to these different personas but also how do we not have these personas when we need to have mm -hmm. them in different context very interesting concern especially given your line of work that's such a valid concern in that field especially as in many fields and when it comes to certain responses that we have Notice I didn't say reactions, but responses. A reaction is something that's knee-jerk, often stems from a personality tendency, yet is not probably well thought out. It's just off the cuff. A response is something that is deliberated, not robotic in a way, but still a responsible reaction, if you will, to a situation. Now, when it comes to working with people, especially in a field where empathy is required, especially where they have to see the real you. But at the same time, some guardedness has to be there because it's uh, either a professional environment in that way or you're dealing with delicate parts of people's personalities. One thing to keep in mind is there are so many ways to achieve a certain response. Where if disarming, being disarming is the intention that I have. We're not seeming so uptight so that people are more susceptible to open up and be themselves in turn. That kind of disarming can be done with different kinds of connections. There is that kind of humor, for instance, that builds that bond with someone so easily. And without humor, there's a way of a shared experience that can be discussed of, look, I went through something, you went through something similar, and there's that bond that builds there. Now, when it comes to genuinity, then, especially <laughs> the past one and a half years, we've been in an election cycle where you can see these town halls and the primaries of all these candidates being there, where any question that comes up, they can point and say, you know, I know a guy, I met a guy recently, Harem in New York, who's working on this factory line. And, you know, he told me it's hard to make ends meet. They off, they can just come up with this stuff. You know, it's not genuine, man. They're making it up like it's just something that's being out of thin air. So the lack of genuinity comes when we're betraying from the truth, when we're not actually sticking to a real experience, trying to contrive it or exaggerate it. That's when it doesn't come across as genuine. But if it's coming from a place of a true experience had by someone, that genuinity just does come through, comes through in a very big way. Just my thought on that. Second question now. This was an interesting one. 
what is that fine line between inflating myself for a functional purpose versus giving in to manitvam and dumpitvam? So for this one, I thought, um, Ashwin, in your group, there were some interesting things said about this one, kind of an interesting train of thought here. Uh, Ashwin Chandra, what were your thoughts on this? Um, we, so Sri Tate actually talked about, uh, conflating or not conflating, but, uh, in his line of work, whether to talk about a, or using like a practical lie. So he's a photographer and trying to get clients saying, you know, I do many weddings versus I've done 50 weddings. So that 50 is a, is an objective, not objective, sorry. It's a, it's a number that can be, I guess, traced, but I mean, the, the point is trying to get across is it's comfortable with weddings and doing photography for that, but whether to use that as a way to get further in his field or not. Um, and we related that to the story of Ashwatthama um, with uh, telling a lie to get a point across. Yeah. So 50 weddings may be a flex, but it's still objective at the same time, kind of a fine line there. Adrushi, what would you say? Um, so I think it's probably also worth noting that when we think about inflating ourselves for functional purposes, like the example you were talking about with like work, I think a lot of times it can also be considered a way of just standing up for yourself. And, um, I think that sometimes that's like on the flip side of it, like the flip kind of negative side is like ego boosting, but I think that sometimes it's important to, like verbalize those things, not just in a professional context, but it also helps to kind of remind ourselves of what our worth is. And I think that that's kind of the other side from like ego boosting and kind of the negative um, associations with like the positive associations that come from inflating yourself as well. And I think that especially for women, I feel like that gets lost a lot. So I was thinking about it as like a, like a, like the positive flip side too. <laughs> True. True. We're given some environments where I think as men, we often overlook this, not on purpose, but just our mind doesn't go there. Many spaces where based on your gender or your race, orientation, any of these factors, um, you're already given a certain label right away. To break out of that shackle then requires quite a lot of vocalization to get out of that. Just because people's perceptions are so sticky and so instant in many ways. Now, one interesting thing you brought up, Arushi, to expand on here is there are some metrics that just help as indicators. We may think these pontificate our personalities and are building ourselves up, but they indicate things like hard work, things like achievement. For example, as of the last census that came out, the highest earning ethnic group in this country is Indian Americans by a large number, because the median family household income in this country is $51,000 a year. The median Indian household income in America is $101,000, almost twice the national median. Now, from one perspective, that could be seen as a flex and we're bragging, saying, oh, look how rich we are. But uh, she said the flip side of something. Flip side to me is, isn't that one tangible indicator of hard work, of innovation, of persistence, of educational attainment, these are markers that reflect that. So not about the money as something to brag about as a community, I'm talking, but it is something indicative of those values we hold so dear, we are seeing the prosperous result of those highly held values. Now, is there a drawback where now we measure each other's self-worth by their net worth? Yes, that does happen in our community quite often. Yet, indicators are indicators at the end of the day. That does play a role that we cannot discount, but we can't get carried away with that either. Any other thoughts from anyone? That fine line between functionally inflating myself versus giving in to Manitwan and Dambitvam? There's the one group of, which group has not said anything yet? Safely hiding behind. Mm, ah, 
A group of Ritesh, Hemant, Eric, and Dhruv has been suspiciously quiet. What are your thoughts on this question? Any one of you four? Yes, yeah, so um, and I think in our group we were talking basically about um, like you know it's um, and we basically said you know it's okay to you know want certain things you know like a promotion or you know like more money or you know like more uh, you know basically more of anything uh, provided you don't put down others you know like in the way of doing so like um, and then you know we brought about the example you know that uh, there are some athletes you know who are who are great not just because of their skill but because like if some like an, if an opposing person may be injured or you know like they get into it they don't they'll actually take the time to go and help and like we were using those examples that yeah they show true sportsmanship on the way and that's what makes them you know like so great not just like their skills but the fact that they don't care so much about the win so much as you know like helping someone who may be in need interesting point Anyone else from any of the groups have a thought on this last question? On that fine line? All right, then. This was a pleasure to conduct with everyone, our first in the Shik Satsang series. And I, I'm assuming many of you found out about this or got the update based on being part of the Chick West WhatsApp community. Is that where you got it from? Encourage your friends to be a part of it. Even if there are those who are just now starting out in Chick and just came for a couple meetings, opportunities like the satsang information about camps that are coming up information about the youth empowerment program that's coming up so yesterday was vijay dashami so hopefully we you all had a very auspicious culmination of navaratri festivities but being vijay dashami we launched yep 2025 yesterday where this eighth batch will happen from june 1st to july 19th 2025 at chinmayo mangalam in central texas so this is something we'd love to have you come and attend. Um, several people in this meeting right now have attended the Youth Empowerment Program in the past. And this is a program that whether it's about finding yourself in the crossroads of life um, between a job and grad school or between high school and college or college and work or you're just in the middle of everything. When have we ever, give, ever given ourselves the gift of constant satsang for two months straight every single day? When have we given ourselves that gift? And if passing up that opportunity while it's there, is there a guarantee we'll get that opportunity later in life? With all the busy lives we lead, it's no guarantee. So this is something to take advantage of. Um, the information was broadcast out through CMW yesterday. And on Chick West's YouTube channel, we'll have lots of information there periodically, consistently coming up, as well as in our newsletters and other avenues as well. So keep an eye on that. If you have any questions about it, please reach out to one of the three Brahmacharians leading Chick West. That's myself, Brahmachari Hari Chaitanya, Brahmachari Shubhaniji in the East Coast, and Brahmachari Sohamji in the West Coast. So with that, such a pleasure to conduct this. Thank you very much for your thoughts and your attention and coming in on a Sunday evening. We hope to see you next month as well. Let's do the closing prayers now. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om Stay happy, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Hari everybody.